So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to the Invest Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and I'm joined today by Josh Ziegelbaum. Josh is responsible for managing investor communications, onboarding, individual and commercial clients, as well as overall support of community company initiatives. The dynamic work experience Josh has gained throughout his career gives him a unique perspective on both sales and operations. Prior to joining Legacy Group, Josh worked as Vice President of Business Development for Life of Far Capital, a boutique private equity and asset management firm where he led his team's capital raising efforts. Before that, he was a private bank for Wells Fargo, the focus on complex credit needs and investments in public securities. During his time at Wells Fargo, Josh climbed through the ranks and received multiple internal recognitions and awards for his efforts. He most recently managed a book of business for high net worth individuals and business owners in Miami Beach. Josh is originally from New Jersey, where he studied economics at Rutgers, received a Series 7 license in 2017. He's known for his passion around building deep relationships and his clients and for consistently acting in their best interests. Josh, welcome to the show. Johnny, it's great to be here on your show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Very excited for today's conversation. Uh, we have a lot in common already. Also grew up in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Uh, right near Atlantic City. And uh, also had my Series 7 at one point. So, ah, Very cool. So I'm sure we'll have a nice conversation here today for your listeners. Absolutely. Very excited to get into it. Um, you guys are big in the alternative investments, uh, even more alternative. I, it's funny that real estate is considered alternative, but even more alternative uh, than your traditional kind of real estate. But um, we kind of alluded there what you were doing before. So kind of just touch real quick how you ended up in real estate, kind of leaving that, that sector. Sure. You mentioned my background. So I have a finance background, studied economics out of college. I started my a stint in insurance. I briefly realized that that's not really what I wanted to do and what I was passionate about. So I found my calling at Wells Fargo, uh, climbed through the ranks, uh, got my series seven, started working with investment products. And I was kind of noticing that most of the products that the banks were offering were very similar to one another. And the returns that I was seeing, you know, they were, they were okay, but they weren't, you know, life-changing type returns. It was through a personal investment that I made in real estate in New Jersey that I realized the power of leverage, the power of real estate in general, and how it could really be like an escalator towards building wealth. So I started developing a passion for that on the personal side. I did continue my career in banking, um, did a lateral, came down to Miami with my wife back in 2018. It was a nice time to come pre-COVID, uh, but I'm enjoying my time down here as is everyone else. So I was working with the bank um, at my initially on the transfer here. And then I found an opportunity to work in alternatives. So I got a position as a vice president of business development, worked on capital raising for syndicated real estate projects. We were building out hotels in Puerto Rico, uh, short-term rental projects in Medellin, Colombia and the surrounding area. So it was definitely focused on uh, emerging markets um, even then. Um, and now I, I head up investor relations for Legacy Group um, as its director, and we're currently focusing on real assets in Colombia, more specifically agriculture. Um, that's kind of our bread and butter right now. We're definitely in other markets as well, such as technology, um, 3D art and design, and some other things. But on the real estate side, uh, we have the second largest coffee producer in Colombia today through our portfolio company, Green Coffee Company. And we have the business on track to be the largest producer of coffee in the country uh, this year. So we're opening up access to Colombia, to agriculture and real estate, uh, to primarily high net worth uh, US-based investors. Uh, we've made it as easy and frictionless as possible by structuring the offering here in the US so we're issuing common equity to our investor base and giving them access to real estate, alternative assets um, through our portfolio companies in Colombia. Interesting. Very, very interesting. What is it about that market that kind of sticks out from an agricultural standpoint? Sure. So when we think of coffee, many people think of Colombia. It, it's actually the national product there. Uh, you know, it really is something that holds up a lot of the communities in which uh, coffee is grown. 
there's just so much opportunity for disruption in the market. So we saw that it was primarily controlled, the coffee land was primarily controlled by smaller land holding families who've had the, the, the uh, land for generations using very kind of antiquated practices in their farming. So we saw opportunity uh, to go in by at scale and start to really start to scale up kind of a US style business, but in a market where that doesn't exist. So we're providing kind of fair and equal employment. We're doing a lot on the environmental side. So our investors get behind that. But just from a business standpoint, there's so much opportunity to buy assets at deep discounts. I mean, the labor pool in Colombia is exceptional. And, um, you know, coffee itself is a commodity that's primarily denominated in dollars. So when you sell it globally out of Colombia, it's, it's marked in USD. So you're able to kind of get labor and land at, at more favorable prices that you could produce US dollar denominated assets in terms of, you know, the agricultural piece and provide, you know, really high potential returns to our investor base. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, that's so great that you guys are kind of taking that on to, you know, obviously, you, you could run it the way that they would and, and kind of do those kind of labor um, laws and things that they follow. But that's awesome that you guys are trying to improve that. How has that been accepted, you know, over there? Sure. At first, you know, as you can imagine, there's a bit of friction from the community seeing the Americans come in, but that quickly changed when, when the community started to realize the way in which we do business really lifts them up. So we're the largest employer in the town of Salgar. It's a few hours outside of Medellin. Uh, that's where our primary land holdings are. And, you know, now today, when you go and ask the employees, you know, they're happy, they're smiling, they love to go to work. We have tons of videos and footage that we share with our, with our followers and our investors showcasing that. So we're definitely well received at this point. We have great relationships locally with the mayor on a federal level. Uh, we're part of CEA Columbia, which is the Council for American Enterprises doing business there. So we have a lot of uh, of exposure, strong reputation at this point, And I would say very well received by the locals. Awesome. That's very cool. So before what, what, um, you know, obviously your job is to educate like, you know, retail sophisticated investors. Uh, was it a lot of institutional over there before, or, you know, where, when did the transition start or what initiated the transition to getting more, you know, people, retail investors, I guess, kind of into this uh, asset class? Sure. I would say that, you know, there really aren't any competitors in terms of U.S. companies that are doing what we're doing and bringing down institutional or retail capital into Colombian coffee. I mean, there's, it's happening in other industries. We're seeing kind of like a birth of venture capital in, in Latin America and in Colombia, but on the Colombian coffee side, you know, I don't see, I haven't come across anyone that's doing what we're doing on an institutional side or a retail side. I mean, think about this with, you know, just under 30 million in capital, we've been able to build the soon to be largest producer of coffee in that country. 30 million here in the US, if you're thinking about commercial projects, I mean, that's enough to like build the apartment building across the street or maybe not even <laughs> from, from where I'm, I'm living here in Fort Lauderdale. So capital goes such a long way. And, you know, I, I see our business becoming more institutional in nature. To date, we've gone primarily to or exclusively to high net worth individuals and retail investors, as you said. But as we're kind of pivoting now and looking towards the next funding round, we're looking at a Series C round in July, upwards of $100 million in terms of a capital raise to bolt on to the, to the 30 that we brought in so far through the B round. And with that, I expect institutional capital to follow. Uh, we're having conversations now with several investors on the equity and debt side of the stack and to try and really fill out this Series C. But I do expect that we'll also have retail investors involved. Um, but just based on the size and the scale of what we're doing and, and the sophistication of the operation, we'll definitely start attracting uh, institutional investors. And, and we're having conversations as we speak. Wow, that's awesome. So this is more of a a startup, so to speak, or as opposed to like syndications and, and different things like that. So what is it, what does it look like on your end? You know, you're obviously directly involved with the investors in terms of education and, and even finding investors who are, you know, interested in this alternative investment. Yeah. So on your first point, you know, uh, 
it is similar to, it, it is a syndicated product. So while it is a startup and it's, well, or I would call it an early stage business at this point, you know, because we've already, you know, really sophisticated what we're doing, but it's an investment in, a, in an operating business that owns real assets. So rather than investing in a, in a syndicated commercial real estate project where you have the upside of the building and the increase in rents, and then there's an exit through either a refinance or a sale sometime, usually three to five years is, is what asset managers target. We're building out a, a collateralized uh, enterprise, you know, where investors are not only owning a portion of the farmland, they're owning a portion of the infrastructure, the rights to the cash flows from our trading business, then future verticals that we're adding to the company. And of course, all of the farmland and the production of the uh, of the coffee trees. That's so a really interesting product in that regard uh, for investors. It is very similar to a syndicated real estate project from from a structural component. We're issuing common equity in a holding company, and then based on how much investors commit, they own a percentage of that business. And then once we exit through sale, or more preferably an IPO here in the states, investors will get distributions based on their investment amount or, or based on their percentage owned in the business. And um, there's a cash flow component that we're modeling in in terms of dividends. But really, the bulk of the return will come through the realization of appreciation through sale or or through IPO. On the educational side, you know, these are kind of the conversations that, that I'm having with my investor base. You know, for investors, it's, it's somewhat, you know, at, at first glance, it's a bit harder for them to wrap their head around it. But when, once they start looking at our materials, they get subscribed to our newsletter, they quickly become very comfortable. And then seeing kind of what's going on in the U.S. in terms of instability in the markets, on the public markets, that is. Um, kind of the frothiness we're seeing in the real estate market here in the States, investors are eager to look outside of the U.S. into emerging markets. And we think Colombia is the go-to market. When you think of emerging markets, a lot of people think Asia. I don't know about you, but that's not where I want to be deploying my capital right now, what's nope. going on. But the, I still want diversification outside of the U.S. So we think LATAM, more specifically the market we're in, is the place to be. And compared to other kind of early stage companies where you're investing in intellectual property and guys are targeting 100x, 1000x returns, you know, that, that might be a moonshot, right? But we're building a, a, a real business that's a balance sheet business and we're forecasting 8x returns net through 2026, obviously way higher than you can expect in, in the public markets. But, you know, we believe that we have uh, the skills and the expertise to make that happen for our business and for our investor base. Awesome. I love that. And, and um, you know, you mentioned, obviously, you know, a lot of people look at Asia. I've always kind of considered Latin America. I know a lot of, you know, kind of forward thinkers have been looking down there um, and it's starting to show, right? You're starting to see more opportunity to invest um, internationally. Um, so is Colombia and the surrounding area, are they putting an infrastructure to help support all of this? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you go into Medellin, into the city or, or into Bogota, you feel like you're in certain parts, you're in like an American city. I mean, some of those restaurants that I go out to are, are nicer than what I find by my house in Florida. So but the roads, you know, in the city, everything is, you know, very clean and structured. Obviously, to get out to the farms, it's much more rural. I mean, there are roads out there. Uh, generally, when we go out on investor trips, we take uh, helicopters in, in order to do a, to a tour, and, and then we'll like land out there and spend a day out at the farms. But most of those who work on the farms, they, they live locally in those communities, so not so much of an issue in, in getting them transportation uh, to and from the farms. Um, but, you know, the in infrastructure investments are happening um, in Medellin. They recently built a tunnel that goes through one of the mountains that expedites your speed coming from the airport to downtown. So nothing like that I've ever seen here in the U.S. So I, I would argue that there is money being spent on infrastructure to support all the investment that that's happening in the region. Awesome. I love that. Obviously, super important when when you're getting into those emerging markets that, you know, the, the government is is supporting that as well. So. You kind of mentioned in the, um, a little bit there how, you know, you're using American methods in terms of, you know, uh, favorable working conditions and labor laws and things like that. Talk about the importance of that for you guys. Obviously, investors can get behind that as well, but then also, you know, the importance uh, over there. Yeah, I mean, just touching on the social impact, I mean, the Colombian coffee industry, 
you could almost generalize this to be like Latin American agriculture. It's very informal. I mean, people are paid cash. They're not given formal benefits that we expect here as employees in the U.S. People get hurt generally in the industry that so be it. They're, they're just left to, to the wayside. Um, but the way in which we do things is entirely different. We're, we're providing equal and fair employment. We're paying above average wages with benefits, paid time off. Uh, we're, we're building up the communities that we, in which we operate. We're helping them build credit. Um, you know, we're doing things very differently. And we're also buying cherries at fair, coffee cherries at fair prices from neighboring farms, processing those in our facilities. So we're uplifting the community for sure. I mean, those are things, if I told you, you know, formal employment, yeah, that, that's what we have, right? But in that region, that, that's not how it is. So that's really revolutionizing the business and, and the way in which, in which coffee is produced there. Um, from an environmental standpoint, uh, we have sustainable planting methods. We're reducing a lot of waste, reducing water. Um, so we're doing things on that end. So it's most certainly an impact investment, that's for sure. Awesome. I love that. And uh, I know that's, that's obviously, like I mentioned, very important to investors. A lot of investors only do impact projects anyways. So, you know, another awesome um, kind of diversified investment that they can add to their portfolio. You know, obviously here in the U.S., it's a lot of affordable housing and things like that. Um, farmland, regenerative farming, that kind of thing. Um, and I can imagine that a lot of the farming practices out there were not the best for the land. And ultimately that ends up costing in the long run. So by implementing these better practices, you ultimately, you know, build that longer term um, soil and, and the ability to, to continue for, for a long period. Yeah, absolutely, Johnny. Awesome. I love that. So you mentioned that uh, eventually there's going to be some more verticals and things like that. So, uh, you know, you mentioned potential IPO, things like that, but you know, what other verticals and what does the future kind of look like for you guys uh, moving forward? Sure. So looking at kind of the use of proceeds in our next funding round, which I alluded to, which we're, which we're launching in the next couple months here, uh, we want to continue to acquire farmland in Salgar. Uh, that's the town in which I've been talking about here during this interview. And we want to also start acquiring farmland in another region um, near the coffee triangle. So we can have year round production right now uh, where we have a primary harvest towards the end of the year each year. But if we can acquire farms in another region, we're able to have year round production, and more stable revenue streams. So definitely bolting on additional land, uh, planting additional trees on that land and then kind of looking you know, a little bit forward um, in 2023, we're planning to construct a U.S. roaster facility. Uh, the business model today is wholesale B2B green coffee, which is a processed but unroasted coffee. And if we're able to control more of the supply chain, but through a roaster, we could funnel all this product that we're producing down in Colombia through the U.S., through a roasting channel, and make significantly more margin per pound that's produced on the farms and in our facilities. And then beyond that, we want to continue to operate at scale, start preparing for an exit, at that point, we believe we'll be in a position to do so. We're targeting 2026. And um, in terms of some other verticals beyond that, we're doing coffee trading. We're looking at, we're doing some research around byproducts. So whether we can make like a alcohol or some sort of alternative byproduct from, from what's now garbage, this, this, the, uh, the waste from the cherries. So that could even surpass the coffee business at, at a point we may be in the byproduct business so uh, so that's something really exciting that we haven't modeled in even to our financials but um those are some of the other verticals that, that we're looking at in the years to come here wow that's awesome and, and a lot of opportunity um you know still obviously to be had and uh just this is a cash flowing investment right like you invest in it it does cash flow or is this more of an upside uh investment that's a great question, Johnny. We are modeling in cash flow, so we're expecting annual dividends throughout the holding period. Um, but really, the bulk of the return, uh, the total return, would be at exit, and that's what I get excited about. That's what our investors get excited about. But but we definitely have uh, some cash flow modeled in. Awesome, I love that. Um, it's important, I think, as an investor to diversify across that, especially, you know, if if you're at that stage in your investing period where you don't necessarily need cash flow, right? Because it sounds like the upside here is, is obviously massive potentially. 
And so, you know, that's very attractive to investors who may not necessarily need that, that cash flow. Yeah. For awesome. Sure. Well, as we kind of wind down here, um, got five questions I asked all of my guests. Uh, it's the final five. Let's do it. First question, uh, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? I would say to focus on your education and knowledge. You know, that's something that people can't take away from you. You know, there's ups and downs in the market. Your portfolio might fluctuate. You know, there could be losses and relationships or in your family, which are just things we have to deal with. But your education and your knowledge is something that can't be taken away from you. Awesome. I love that. So true. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? I love helping people and giving them access to unique opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have access to and treating them in a way that I would want to be treated as a client. You know, I, I wouldn't do anything or recommend anything that I wouldn't personally do. So um, it's very fulfilling to me to know that at a, as a business at Legacy Group and through our portfolio companies, we're doing the right thing um, from an investment standpoint, uh, from an impact standpoint. And, you know, I feel very good, like seeing how happy my investors are, you know, as we roll out our updates and talk about things that are forthcoming. And it's very fulfilling to me. Awesome. I love that. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Favorite non-real estate book. I'm looking at them right here. Uh, I think the compound effect is, is a... Uh, is a good one. I mean, it's not really specific to investing or real estate, but it's applicable in every part of your life. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's what I'm looking for is something kind of outside of that, that scope. So that's perfect. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, to predict the future. That, that, would be, <laughs> that would be a cool one. You know, Gosh, every time be nice. you know, being in finance, you know, you look at Everything that happens in the markets, you look back on it and you're like, oh, of course, right? <laughs> so if you had a crystal ball, it'd be pretty interesting, right? But that'd be a cool superpower. And you could use it as a force for greater good, most likely as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. It's funny um, being removed now from the stock market and still invested in the market. I'm like, gosh, I was like, this is not, this, this isn't it for me. I just wrote a blog about it too. But um, yeah, that's, that would, that would be nice for sure. Uh, cool. And what's the best way, last one, best way for people to get a hold of you and uh, learn more? Yeah, please visit us on our website. That's legacy-group.co. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter there. That's definitely the best way to stay informed. You can also shoot us an email, investor.relations at legacy-group.co. And then we're on social media. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. That's our, that's our main channel, I would say. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time, Josh, and uh, your insight into these uh, awesome alternative investments. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. It was great talking to you. And I'm Absolutely. looking forward to uh, staying in touch. Likewise. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Uh, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.